So first of all, thank you all for joining us for the first Identity and Access Management Open Source Support Briefing of 2021. So we're real excited to talk to you about some of the happenings since we last spoke. We're gonna go ahead and go through our agenda here. So we're the first topic is gonna to be what we're calling IAM Spotlight. And you're gonna hear about some upcoming events and some recommendations. And then we're gonna shift over and hear a little bit from our grouper specialist to talk about the work that's been done in that area. We're gonna shift on to sh hear about Shibleth and then we'll move on to CAS and then we'll wrap up with Midpoint. As we go through the different sections, we've got a few questions, uh, some polls. So we hope to get some good information from the team as we move forward to help us in our efforts as we move forward with the open source support program. So to kick us off, I would like to introduce Mike Grady. Hi, this is Mike Grady. I'm an IAM architect with uh, with Unicon. And first, I'd like to highlight uh, a set of events happening in 2021. Um, pretty much all virtual, except potentially Educause, which apparently is planning to have a hybrid. Of, you can attend online or potentially attend in person. Um, so first of all coming up this summer will be the in common base camp that's really targeted towards folks new to identity and access management at their institution trying to get a really good grounding in pretty much higher ed iam and the technology and the uh, internet to technology adoption platform products um, that you know that make up our agenda today um, so that's in mid-july and then uh Closing tomorrow is the call for proposals for Internet 2 camp. Uh, so there'll be a camp week, both the, uh, the camp and uh, advanced camp happening the, the week of October 4 to 8, all, you know, all online, um, you know, focusing on, you know, all things, again, identity and access management and higher ed federation, et cetera. Um, in common has a ongoing rotation of training classes which again are all still being held virtually right now and the url is there for the schedule uh, there are classes in all of the um, uh, you know shibboleth grouper midpoint and uh, co-manage so you can check that url to see what the, the dates are of the next one in, in any one of those but they have a rotating schedule for those and then Educause uh, 2021 is at the end of October. And as I say, um, assuming they, uh, they, they do manage to still have a physical presence, that's gonna be in Philadelphia this year, but there'll also be uh, the option to attend it online. So a few other things we just like to highlight in terms of interesting things happening broadly in the identity and access management space. First of all, all of you who are members of In Common have probably been getting notification from In Common in the last several months about baseline expectations too. Uh, if you haven't, then you're probably already in line with it. But if you're if you're missing any of the new requirements to meet what In Common considers, you know, uh, the baseline for any member of In Common, um, you would have been getting an email highlighting the things that you needed to complete. Uh, by what's been, uh, I think, July 19th is the date this year that those are supposed to be accomplished by. Um, furthermore, there's also been communication from in common on changing requirements for uh, accessing uh, National Institutes of Health applications through your IEP. So, you know, any number of you that, certainly those of you that have a large research um, uh, operation at your institution, very likely have researchers that um, are getting funds from uh, NIH and they have uh, occasion to need to access electronic research administration and other apps that NIH runs for, for managing your grants. Um, and NIH is putting in new requirements around MFA and around identity assurance. The initial requirements go into effect in uh, mid-September this year and then there'll be a stricter assurance or set of requirements that will be enforced at the end of 2022. That's to give everybody a chance to both define exactly what those assurance requirements are, 
um, and to accomplish those assurance requirements. That, that gets back to the concept of how sure are you that the individual who has this credential is the biological person that you're saying it is. And that gets into your business process around onboarding people and giving them their, you know, letting them set their initial password and, and other things, how good a job you do around that. Um, those of you who've been around a long time will remember um, a focus on um, in common bronze and silver at one point in time, which was an effort to align with NIST assurance standards. Well, this is a new um, broader standard and, and NIH is promoting um, uh, REFEDS, which is the Federation of Federations in common and higher ed federations around the globe have defined an assurance framework and what that might mean. And there are groups now, both in common and in REFEDS that are trying to uh, put out more information so that institutions have better guidance about what they might need to do with their business processes and record keeping, et cetera, to be able to assert that this identity is at a certain assurance level. So you wanna keep your eye on, on, on that. And if you're, particularly if you're, you know, if, a, if it's a big deal for your institution accessing federal, various federal federated services like NIH and other things, you'll, you'll really wanna pay particular attention to that. Another effort that being pushed primarily by Google, but, but there is some involvement from Apple also, uh, but Google's really the, the primary force behind this. There, there's an effort to get a lot stricter in what the web browsers allow in terms of cookies and, and redirects. The, the bottom line is to promote higher privacy and, and you know, the users who don't wanna be tracked, not being tracked and give, you know, give better built-in security in the browser to do that. But some of the things that Google has been talking about doing would essentially break how we all do single sign-on today. It would break, you know, it all comes down to cookies and redirects, whether you're using the SAML protocol or the CAS protocol, or if you're using OpenID Connect and, and, and OAuth 2. I mean, it all comes down to uh, cookies and redirects and some of the things they've been talking about would essentially break enterprise single sign-on. So there are um, various groups that are, uh, you know, have established a dialogue with Google and the efforts that, that they have to, to do this, to give feedback about the use cases that are critical for higher education, for federations, uh, for single sign-on in general to work. Um, but that's another area that, you know, you may want to keep an eye on. Um, that one URL is a, is a GitHub URL is one you could go to to see more information and, and also a way of uh, one of the places collecting feedback um, on, on uh, use cases that, that, you know, lots of places are interested in the browser still allowing. Um, the last thing I'd like to highlight is ID Pro. So ID Pro, I think, first heard about it roughly five years ago, a few years back, it started up and it's been percolating slowly, but it's starting to, to gain some traction. And, and the, the basic idea behind it is to recognize that identity and access management is a discipline that requires a particular set of skills and knowledge and to provide a greater recognition of that as a unique track of, of specialization um, and also certification that organizations could look at and know that somebody has, uh, you know, a, a pretty good IAM background. And they are in the process of developing their first set of certification tests now. And you can find out more information if you go to the link in the slide. Uh, the other thing I'll highlight is there is higher ed input to that. So, high, um, uh, in common has been aware of this and other federations and there are folks involved in <clears throat> in common and others who are writing articles for them and <clears throat> trying to help make sure that the IAM perspective represented there is not just from the corporate viewpoint but also from the the higher ed viewpoint 
Great, thanks, Mike. Um, I wanted to add another note before we move forward. If anybody has questions on any of the content as we move through from area to area, feel free to go ahead and start typing questions. The there are many people from Unicon on this call that will uh, do our best to start answering them as we go through them. And as time permits, we can review at the end of the call as well. So with that said, I'd like to introduce uh, Jonathan Johnson, who's gonna talk to us about Grouper. All right, thanks, Sharice. Hi, my name is JJ. I am one of your senior IAM consultants. So the Grouper developers have been hard at work working on Grouper 2.5 on their march towards Grouper 2.6 or 3.0. They haven't really decided what the next version number is going to be called. But there, have, there has been a lot of work out there since the last time we've met. A lot of that is around some administrative experiences in particular. So there is a new provisioning framework that they are working on that is to eventually replace the PSPNG. Uh, that will, the PSPNG will eventually be deprecated. So you will wanna look out for that. On top of work for those new provisioning frameworks and Part of the reason for those new provisioning frameworks is to provide some new administrative interfaces out there so that you can more easily manage your Grouper installation. For those of you that may have been running Grouper for, for a long time, you might remember some of the older interfaces out there that were ex extremely clunky, actually user uh, <laughs> They, they seem to really hate the users back then at some level, uh, particularly when you were looking at the admin specific interfaces, but they have, as you, as you know, they have the new UI out there, but they're enhancing it more and more by adding in more, uh, more administrative interfaces for configuring external systems, configuring these provisioners, adding in report, new reporting interfaces, et cetera. On top of the administrative side of things, they have been continually improving the performance. They have significantly improved the performance of the PSPNG in their transition from 2.4 to 2.5, but even further, they have improved it over the life of 2.5. On top of that, they have made some container improvements if you are running Grouper 2.5 now and you, <clears throat> and you do run into some problems and you think, hey, it would be really nice if the image did this, certainly reach out to the developers, jump into the Slack channel, let them know what you're looking for and they would certainly help you out with that. Uh, speaking of Slack and kind of hot off the presses here and to kind of insert into something that Mike mentioned earlier, there is grouper training scheduled for the fall of this year, but currently the Internet 2 is polling the community asking if, if there were an earlier training available let them know and they might consider it in the June, July timeframe. So I figured I'd throw that out there. If you're on the Slack channel for Grouper, there's a, there's a poll there from Aaron. So if we go on to the next slide. And here I have a couple of slides that show what some of these new administrative interfaces look like. Here we're looking at the external systems interface. So you can see here that you have the ability to see what types of systems that you have. For instance, you can see an LDAP, uh, an SMTP server and a database. You have mostly full administrative access here. So if you were to, for instance, click on that actions over on the right side there for the ban banner DVLP database, go, go ahead and go to the next slide, Steve. You would, you would be presented with an interface that looks like this, where you can go in and configure your database without having to go out to your grouper loader stop property file to do that. 
it is guided so you can see here that you do have markings there for required fields. This configuration is going to be saved out there to the database. So if you go in and modify it on one server, when that configuration change is picked up on it, any of your other servers, uh, it will be reflect, reflective of the database configuration, or I should say the configuration in the database, not to confuse you since this is database configuration here. So if we go to the next slide here, Unicon has been involved with some sustaining engineering over the last several months, working with some of you all uh, to provide some value back to the community and to you all. A couple of things that have popped up, we are working on a new external authentication system for Grouper. That external authentication system supports currently OIDC, SAML2, and CAS, and provides an easier way for you to go out there and configure authentication. Those protocols, uh, particularly the OIDC uh, <clears throat> and one of the profiles for SAML2 will also be useful or usable for your web services and not just your UI. Along with that, and I know some of you on this call right now were involved in this, but we have been involved with or working with the Grouper developers to fix several small bugs out there uh, to help them along with getting to the next version of Grouper. And with that, that's Great, thank you, JJ. All right, time for a question, here we go. Do you allow access to the Grouper UI to users outside of your IAM team? And really specifically, are you running Grouper 2.5? I'm really disappointed, Sharice, that I can't stuff the ballot here. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> we appreciate all of your participation. Thank you. All right, let's move that. All right, so next up is Mike Grady is going to talk about Shibboleth. So uh, in the Shibboleth world, um, uh, first of all, the identity provider, hopefully you're all aware that at this point, you should be running some version of IDP4. Um, the, the 3x line of the IDP uh, reached end of life at the end of 2020. Um, and at this point, uh, 4.1 just came out uh, a, a few weeks back, um, yeah, a month or maybe a month and a half. And uh, so technically at this point by the core SHIB team, version 4.1 of the IDP is considered to be the only current supported version of the IDP. Um, the, uh, but you know, you're really not too far behind if you're on 401, which was the version prior to 4.1. Um, and it's pretty easy, actually. We, we've uh, we've tried it and we've, we've helped several clients to do it already. And we've tried it uh, uh, with some other instances of the IDP. It's actually pretty easy to upgrade from, from 4 to 4.1, or you can even upgrade from 3 directly to 4.1. Um, but you want to be careful to make sure that ideally you're running a 3.4 version of the IDP before you try to do that upgrade so that you get all the deprecation warnings about syntax you need to fit in, fix in your config files before those config files would work with a version of IDP 4. Um, but again, just to highlight, if you're still on 3, you really do need to be making plans to, to get upgraded to a version of 4. Uh, and at this point, you'd really want to go to 4.1. The latest version of the SHIB SP is 3.2.2, which came out a few weeks ago as a security release. There's been a couple of point releases of the SP over the last several months to fix uh, denial of service attacks. One of them was a pretty minimal uh, denial of service. So it wasn't that, probably wouldn't 
uh, impact very many folks. But the, the latest one is a very easy to exploit. It, it, you know, it's, it doesn't allow anybody access that they shouldn't have, but they could take your SP down. And it wouldn't be that hard for someone to do that to you. So you really do want to be up and, and it's any version of SP3 that's impacted. Um, so, I mean, if you happen to still be running SP2, you wouldn't be impacted, but again, that's not supported anymore either. So you really should be moving to three and on three, you really wanna to move to 2.2. Um, the other thing to be aware of is that there's a discussion going on about the future of the Shibboleth SP. The, the SP is uh, at its heart, it's uh, C++ code. There are very few folks um, in the broad community that are maintaining an expertise in that and have any interest in working on the Shibboleth SP. So there's really one person at this point who could continue to um, uh, maintain the SP. And that's not a, you know, a sustainable model. Um, Plus, it, uh, because of the way it's architected and some of its underlying libraries and the fact that a lot of those underlying libraries uh, are being maintained by other folks, the, the, the scope of software that the current SHIB SP has to continue to maintain is much broader than, than the, the community would like. So there's a discussion starting now. Uh, the, the, the Shibboleth community has made it clear that there's still interest in there being a Shibboleth provided service provider. The discussion now is what exactly the architecture of that will be and how, how will it be built. And you can follow that and see current thoughts around that at that URL listed on the slide. Advance to the next slide. So what are some of the major new features in SHIB IDP version 4.1? Uh, a key thing to be aware of is that with the growing feature set of the Shibboleth IDP software, one of the things, uh, one of the big differences is that a, a new modules and plugin model have been put into the IDP such that if you were to do a clean new install of the IDP 4.1, the only config files that are exposed to you are a minimal set for a minimal set of features. And if you want to use other features of the IDP, you have to explicitly enable those modules so that those config files are made available to you to, to configure that feature. And even more so with the plugin model, there may be other software that you need to go and get and plug into your IDP. But it does, for the, the nice thing about that is it provides a formal model for folks, including Unicon, to create software to, to plug into your IDP in a way that minimizes the overhead of the work to do that. Um, so that's something that Unicon itself can now work on to modify our extensions to follow that plug-in model. Um, so as I already noted, um, you know, you should be on a four version. You really want to, at this point, upgrade, not do a clean install and migrate. You're going to actually cause yourself a whole lot of extra work if you were to try to do that with four, even more so with 4.1. Um, but if you simply do an upgrade of what you have now, um, you know, uh, modulus, uh, you know, looking at and correcting the deprecation warnings, an upgrade can go very smoothly. And then you can take your time to decide whether you want to adopt some of the new ways of configuring things um, that are available to you with the new version. Uh, on that plugin model out of the box, the plugins provided by the, by the Shibboleth uh, team are uh, OIDC, the new Duo Universal prompt and a uh, TOTP uh, MFA module. The um, and then others can provide other plugins. Like as I say, Unicon will work to make some of our extensions to the IDP available as those types of plugins. There's uh, a lot more opportunity in 4.1 for property-driven behavior. Rather than having as many can XML files to configure the behavior of your IDP, there's a, there's a number of XML files that one can retire, like general auth n, um, and have all of the information you would have had in there just in a property file. 
Um, that's one of those things though, that if you do an upgrade, you can keep, you know, keep your, the XML files you have now, and then when you're ready to move to the property driven model, you can do that at your own convenience rather than having to do all that work up front if you were to do a clean install and migrate. There are a couple of out of the box new flows built into IDP 4.1, sort of a basic hello world, an easier way to test that your IDP is functioning as soon as you install it before you've done any configuration of it whatsoever. There's also a more generalized warning and uh, intercept um, kind of taking the expiring password intercept and making it more generic to, to handle any kind of a warning case. And there's a new external intercept where you could send the user off to a web service through a web service and then come back into the IDP at the, at the, at the right spot in the flow so you can continue or stop the authentication flow at that point in time. Next slide. Shibleth SP, uh, I already mentioned there was a couple of denial of service vulnerabilities that the latest version fixes. Um, there's really just been minor new features uh, and settings, more settings around cookies and HTTP headers for same site and CSRF. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's a discussion more broadly around the future architecture of the SP. Um, and I pretty much touched on all those bullets there already. So we can go on to the next slide. In the sustaining engineering space, we, we continue in the background. We've been working on a password reset extension to the IDP that would be similar to the password reset capability built into the CAS server. Um, we're, we're, as I say, we're going to look at which of our extensions that we've built in the past makes sense to package up as plugins following the full plugin model that 4.1 has now put in place. Uh, we, again, we've been working uh, on a UI around doing Shibboleth login reporting, uh, just kind of analyzing your audit logs. Um, we continue to work on the Shibboleth IDP UI primarily as a project with Internet 2 that to, to add new feature, you know, to to fix anything that that could be clearer and to add new features to it. Um, but we have in the past and there's always the potential that we would do we would if if there were particular interest in the Shibboleth IDP UI from our OSS customers to be able to have this feature or that that Internet 2 was less interested in that we could do that work as sustaining engineering. Um, and then the other question is uh, for any of you is what, what would you like to see added to the IDP? If, if there's additional functionality you'd like to see in the IDP that we could do as sustaining engineering, what, what are those things? And we're always, always eager and open to your input on, on that sustaining engineering. What, you know, the, we, you know, the things that we work on, of course, are driven pretty much by what we see the community asking for potentially different clients in that. So this is just a uh, enhanced another emphasizing that 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 we see you as the driving force behind how we spend those sustaining engineering hours. Thanks, Mike. Uh, before we go to a question, this is kind of a good transition to talk a little bit about sustaining engineering and really getting us that uh, information about what you would like to see as Mike was just talking about. So we're actually going to be adjusting and trying to streamline this conversation, or excuse me, this information from you to Unicon. Um, you're watched to hear about, uh, about that very, very soon. We initially started with CAS to see how it would work and it's going well. And what we've done is created a repository within Unicon that we're opening up and we're asking for usernames. Um, and then we are basically allowing access so that within the, the branch of the GitHub repository, you're able to place your ideas within there. So it'll, it allows for full visibility for you to see everything that's been entered, as well as um, easily allowing us to organize and, and see some um, uh, consistencies in desires for moving forward with this additional sustaining engineering. Remember, this is part of what the program is. So as Mike said, we want to make sure we're doing what's really valuable uh, for our clients and obviously the overall community. All right, with that said, let's go to another question. Are you still operating a SHIB IDP version older than version 4.0? 
Now, do you have plans to use or are you already using the OIDC support in the IDP? To fill some dead air here, Sharice, we did get a question out there in the chat. If we're already using Duo with 4.0, does the 4.1 upgrade give us universal prompt automatically or is more config work required? Uh, did you want to take that one, Mike, or do you want me to? Yeah, so there's a couple of things that you'd have to do. First of all, and we're still, I think, trying to get clarity from Duo, um, it, for a while, use of the universal prompt was a, uh, a specific set of identified beta users of it. So uh, it's not clear to me if anybody can start using it without any interaction with, with Duo throwing a switch on their side or not at this point. It, it might be. Um, but given, given that there's no, there's no um, blockages on the Duo side to using it, Yes, one of the things that 4.1 adds is, um, is Duo Universal Prompt. And those are both packaged as plugins. So you need to use journal, Duo Universal Prompt is based on OIDC. So you need to install two plugins to move to Duo Universal Prompt. You need to install the OIDC Commons Library. So the OID support in IDP 4.1 is broken into two pieces. There's the underlying OIDC library that the dual OIDC plugin depends on and also the OP, the, the actual OIDC identity provider part uh, uh, depends on. Uh, so you need to install two plugins, the underlying commons library and then the dual OIDC plugin and then configure those. And the, the configuration of that is slightly different. There's a couple of different, you, you don't have as many keys um, uh, so it's pretty similar to your current configuration, but just slightly different. But yes, you will have to actually do some work uh, to sh convert over from using the web SDK to using the, uh, the Duo uh, Universal Prompt. Thanks, Mike. All right, so we have our questions answered. If anybody does need help with some of those shiv upgrades, uh, Unicon's happy to help. Go ahead and put in some tickets and we can talk about what's needed to guide you in the right direction. All right, up next, we have Dima talking about CAS. Uh, thank you, Cherise, and uh, hello, everyone. So uh, I'll be glad to give you uh, an update uh, and highlights on the latest uh, CAS uh, server developments for, for, for this uh, round. Um, um, so basically, uh, currently, uh, the generally available version of uh, CAS server is 634, and the development team is actively working on a new major feature release uh, of CAS labeled as uh, 640. And um, the current maintenance uh, and release schedule of CAS uh, looks like this. Um, full end of life for 6.2 series of CAS is scheduled for uh, June 30th of this year. Uh, then uh, full end of life for uh, 6.3 series of CAS is scheduled uh, for uh, the end of this year, December 31st. And uh, 6.4 uh, general availability uh, versions target release date is sometime uh, in July of this year in a, in a couple of months. Uh, and um, version uh, 6.4 uh, had uh, several uh, beta releases, uh, also known as release candidates. And the current release candidate is uh, release candidate 4, which is uh, available uh, for a test drive. Uh, and now uh, I would like to uh, review some of the you know, new, new features available in this upcoming uh, version of CAS. Uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, CAS 6.4 uh, brings an improved, uh, improved documentation experience uh, in, in the documentation side, right? So the documentation has gone through restructuring and cleanup effort to present uh, configuration namespaces and properties uh, settings as searchable snippets uh, right in place uh, within the uh, configuration page for each module, right? So you no longer need to uh, 
hand down to for, for properties uh, throughout the throughout the site. Um, uh, this presentation uh, uh, is entirely driven by CAS configuration metadata, uh, which is based on uh, Spring Boot configuration metadata. Uh, with that, uh, configuration settings, uh, basically docu or documentation for configuration settings need not be uh, manually maintained uh, by uh, maintainers of, of the modules, right? The documentation for each setting is extracted from Javadoc right in the source code and updated dynamically during the uh, documentation site build process, right? Yeah, so for example, if a, a, a configuration setting is owned by a third party extension uh, developer, uh, with an adequate Java doc and link to CAS configuration metadata, uh, its uh, explanation no longer needs to be duplicated in uh, markdown documentation uh, document separately. So this is a great improvement. Uh, next um, item, uh, CAS 6.4 is now based uh, on the uh, upgraded latest version of Spring Boot, which is version 2.4. Uh, while this is invisible to end users, on the surface, uh, this upgrade brings uh, major internal improvements to CAS server, uh, such as performance improvements and uh, uh, you know, Spring Boot bug fixes affecting internal CAS workings. Um, next, um, uh, dedicated uh, Log4j uh, login appender is now available uh, to route logs uh, to Amazon Simple Queue service if such functionality is uh, desired. Uh, also, CAS 6.4 uh, now ships uh, new scriptable search filters uh, for LDAP queries. Uh, such filters can now be designed as uh, groovy scripts uh, to provide more uh, dynamic and flexible uh, querying options. Uh, and also, in this version, uh, CAS logout confirmation screens uh, are able to list all applications a link to existing SSO sessions. So, um, you know, this facility greatly uh, improves uh, debugging and troubleshooting uh, experience. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, so also um, there is now an ability to define course uh, configuration and relevant headers uh, per service definition, uh, which is a great improvement there. Uh, there is, uh, uh, for, for the next item, uh, actually, there is now an ability to override certain settings uh, for uh, delegated uh, SAML to or OpenID Connect uh, provider uh, per service definition. Uh, so, for example, uh, one might choose to send specific SAML to authentication context class uh, to an external uh, SAML to IDP. Uh, based on particular service definition uh, while, uh, for example, leaving uh, other global configuration uh, unmodified. Uh, and also in this version, uh, CAS's own SAML to IDP metadata can now be signed. Uh, then there is now uh, an attribute uh, uh, repository implementation uh, with the ability to resolve uh, authenticated principal attributes from uh, Okta, uh, you know, uh, cloud uh, identity provider uh, there. And also uh, SAML metadata for, for uh, service provider uh, cache policy can now be linked uh, to a registered service uh, expiration policy. Uh, right there in the service definition if such policy is uh, defined. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, and uh, in, in this version, uh, an initial uh, groundwork has been uh, performed um, to, to integrate OpenID Connect conformance test suite with uh, CAS's uh, own continuous integration framework uh, to ensure uh, compliance of uh, CAS uh, OIDC implementation with this uh, OpenID Connect test suite. Uh, and uh, last but not least, um, in this version, the uh, JPA service 
uh, and ticket registries data model uh, models uh, have undergone uh, refactoring and, and, and in their mappings uh, and relationships uh, definitions, which uh, actually resulted in significant uh, performance improvements. Uh, just uh, please note that for service registries that manage services in relational databases, uh, this would be a breaking change, right? So uh, operators are encouraged to take advantage of available uh, export and uh, import uh, facilities uh, provided by CAS uh, during the upgrades. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, this is not a, a, an exhaustive list of features and bug fixes available in, in, in version 6.4. So uh, for, for, for more comprehensive list of features and facilities, uh, you could visit the uh, uh, link included in that previous slide there. Um, and um, basically uh, on the sustaining engineering front for CAS, uh, the Unicon team uh, for, for this period mostly focused on uh, testing, uh, improving and fixing bugs for uh, CAS management web application to, to make sure that this app is, is actually usable for more complex uh, configuration use cases. Uh, and, and we also started work on creating a comprehensive uh, functional test suite for, for, for this management web app using uh, JEB uh, functional testing framework. Uh, so so the, the, the base groundwork uh, has been done and we, we, will, we will continue working on, on improving that test suite. Um, and with that, uh, that is all I have for this uh, period's CAS update. And thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you, Dima. All right, it's time for another question. Are you planning to upgrade your CAS server before the end of the year? And do you, uh, do you use or plan to implement the CAS management application? So our next topic is midpoint. I'd like to introduce Paul. Hello. Everyone, my name is Paul Spouty, your friendly IAM Midpoint Consultant. Um, Midpoint, a lot of things have been uh, changing and, and, and being updated in Midpoint lately. Evolvium has been hard at work uh, releasing 4.2 and now 4.3 um, of their major feature releases. And um, the long-term support release is, is 4.03. So just minor bumps there for bug fixes and other items. Um, the end of life for 4.1 is April 2022 and end of life uh, for 4.03, which is the long term support is September 2022. Um, and so those are where you can get support from Evolvium and or Unicon on those versions. Of course, on open source uh, source support, we support you indefinitely on whatever version you happen to land on. Midpoint 4.03, um, like I said, is mostly bug fixes and point fixes since I last talked with you all, but um, there are a few, you know, key features that I wanted to point out about 4.03 and the 4.0 uh, releases in general. Uh, along with most of the other open source software that we've talked about today, uh, 4.0 has brought Java 11, Tomcat 9, all the latest and greatest of that sort of thing. Uh, the other uh, thing, kind of similar to Grouper, is that uh, the Evolvium has shifted to supporting only Postgres. So they've added Postgres 11 support. Uh, in the long-term support releases, they still support Maria and a few other databases that they used to support. But the expectation is later in the 4X line or 5X, whichever comes first, uh, they will only be supporting Postgres and Oracle in the future. So that's just something to note. Uh, Spring Boot is a big feature that kind of got implemented here in 4X. And so we have um, uh, endpoints, metric endpoints there. And another one I talked about a while ago, but just wanted to bring it up again, they have removed the workflow engine. Uh, it was it had a, a old archaic uh, workflow engine inside of it. They, they have chosen to remove it. Uh, there are a few workflow features still left. They're just natively implemented in midpoint. Um, and Evolvium's and Unicon's recommendation is if you would like to see workflow in Midpoint in the future, um, talk with us uh, and or Evolvium and uh, about funding and integration. They really want to integrate with an outside workflow engine rather than adding all those features back into Midpoint. Next slide. Midpoint 4.2. Um, it brought a, a couple of, of neat features. Flexible authentication. Uh, that's a fancy way of saying external authentication. So 
typically the, the, the means to, to log in with Midpoint in the past has been setting up some sort of, you know, spring security external type item or setting up a Shibboleth SP or other proxy in front of Midpoint and performing authentication that way. That is no longer needed in 4.2. Uh, you have flexible authentication, which is Evolvium's offering of that. You get SAML to open ID connect, uh, rest, a, a few other options in there. Another neat feature is indestructible objects. Uh, a nice feature is to mark an object that it can't be deleted. There are ways to delete it, of course, go in the database or, or you um, finally click through enough prompts, but it really is uh, a way to try to stop people from like deleting accidentally resources or things that you might wanna keep. Evolving has been undertaking several initiatives, mid privacy and mid scale along with others. Uh, mid privacy is the data provenance and privacy um, kind of uh, direction they wanna go. This is due to GDPR and many other uh, regulations that are out there that they have to meet. So what this gives you is where does your data come from and who touched it, which Midpoint already has. Uh, decoupling of audit repository databases is also, an, also a nice feature. Basically uh, in the past, everything was in the single Midpoint database that we all know and love. Now they, you, they have the ability or you have the ability to separate the audit from the actual data in Midpoint. This is beneficial for two reasons. One reason is the audit data gets quite large over time, especially if you have to keep it for several years. Uh, the second item is that you're able to query that or give access to that separately from the actual midpoint objects, which may contain sensitive information and you wanna keep your security products or your other products out of there. Next slide. All right, so midpoint 4.3 is the latest, greatest uh, just released. And this brings the uh, initiative or efforts from mid scale. Uh, Midscale is trying to accelerate Midpoint's flexibility to deal with uh, thousands, millions, really, of identities. Uh, Evolvium's stated goal is about 10 million identities or more. Uh, right now, they feel that they can meet 1 to 10 million uh, pre previously before 4.3. It's still experimental a little bit, but they're getting these features into 4.3 and 4.4. 4. Uh, a new... Um, resource or connector as we call them was added about for asynchronous messaging. So message queuing and message processing is very popular right now in the higher ed communities, especially internet too. And uh, so uh, volume has been hard at work uh, adding that into midpoint um, to use it. One note, the same thing that we'll tell, <laughs> tell you all, uh, Unicon will, is that you want some sort of reconciliation with your, mess your asynchronous messaging because messages might make, get lost. They might not get delivered. Um, so it's one of those things where it's a nice feature to have for more of that real time uh, processing, but you still need something else to go back to. All right, another feature is retries of failed synchronization. So before it was kind of once and done. It would try to synchronize a user or object or other type of, of, of uh, account in a resource. Um, and then it, it would quit, say an error, write and move on. Now there's ability, and it's experimental, to retry uh, an operation. Because sometimes maybe you just, the network's slow or the server returned a 500 or something when it wasn't supposed to, right? It's, it's finicky. And so there's ways to get it to retry, which is kind of a nice feature to have if you're dealing with REST and other endpoints. Um, and then there's early prototype of a scalable repository implementation. So they're just using more and more features of, of Postgres since they can focus on one database. And this is a feature to help them with the mid scale um, to hopefully scale out the database to handle millions of identities. So the, uh, there's a several updates con to connectors here in 4.3 and, and 4.2. Uh, new versions of LDAP, Active Directory, uh, which is, is Microsoft's version of LDAP, uh, database table connector, which is, which is typically SQL. And um, there are future plans. Like I said, there's the asynchronous one. Um, and there is, there, there's work being done in, in the Internet 2 community on a BIS for Banner. Um, and there's work that Unicon has been doing uh, with a few clients on a cloud object storage for CSV. So sending it to S3, for example. Um, and enhancements, there's hand, enhancements all across the board to the grouper connector. So a lot of connector upgrades are going to come down the pike. You're going to be hearing more about that in the future. If you have any issues, please, please let us know. And, and uh, we're, we're happy to help you with that. 
Um, we have future plans for our sustaining support open source support, sustaining engineering hours. Uh, we're gonna probably use those on Grouper Skim and the cloud object, the new cloud object CSV connector. And that's all I had for you today. Any questions? Thanks, Paul. Feel free to type those questions in and we'll get to you. All right. Have you implemented or are considering midpoint? And then just focusing on PostgreSQL way on your midpoint plans. We appreciate your participation. This helps guide, guide us in many ways. So that was our identity team sharing the updates on where these applications are at, as well as some highlights that are going on in the community and our sustaining engineering progress. So this is what we call our open forum. Uh, we'd love to use these last couple minutes to answer any questions that you might have. And you'll get some direct answers from the team here. So we'll kind of watch for the queue to populate and we'll restate and answer any questions that pop up. While that's happening, um, I just wanted to reiterate that sustaining engineering is a critical part of the open source support subscription. We want to do what we can to help with the sustainability of these products. So as you can see, the comments that Paul just talked about around midpoint. So midpoint's made a big turn to realize that to really fulfill higher education needs, they really need to focus and have a dedicated team uh, to continue to enhance the product. And that's exactly what they've done. So um, real exciting. They have a new working group out there as well. You might wanna look into if you're not aware of it um, to go ahead and share your perspective on things. Uh, a lot of activity also happening amongst the uh, other ITAP products as far as Shibboleth and Grouper, those continue to move forward. And you heard a lot from CAS as well from DEMA. So across the board, there's a lot of activity where the community is taping, taking into account many perspectives and what's working and what hasn't worked in the past. So how we can get some additional enhancements and, and issues that were identified resolved. So we really wanna know where to focus our time and that's what we're gonna look forward to hear from you and how we can contribute back to the community but really help our, the needs of our clients um, and then the community as a whole. Let's see, any questions pop up? So we had one from Trey initially, I'm not sure if everybody saw that but that was around Shiv for Shiv V3 versus um, V4, if you're moving from non-container to container architecture, does the upgrade versus new install advice still apply? Um, and the response to that was yes, that you'd want to do an upgrade. Um, there's actually several strategies in doing this. So we're happy to schedule some time with each individual um, institution based on your desire to move forward. Yeah, we'll note that internet to produce a upgrade container that was specifically for running once to switch from three to four zero one. Um, so there is a, and they'll, they're still working on one for 4.1. Um, there are some, 4.1 does raise some new questions around the whole build a container strategy with the modules and plugin model. Um, so as a community, I don't think there's full consensus on exactly what those new Docker recipes would look like yet uh, for 4.1. <coughs> but I know there, there definitely was uh, their uh, internet to Docker container specifically for doing that. Right, write out your config files ready for four and to, to then turn around and use and internet to does have a Docker recipe for 401. Well, actually, they have one updated to 4.1 yet that you could use those same config files in. But as Cherie said, you know, <coughs> you can open a ticket and we can give you more help. Do any of our team members have any other specifics that you left out because of time when you're putting together your presentations? Feel free to go ahead and add. Okay. Oh, did we get a question? All right, we do. I have from Raul, thank you. I have a question. Do you still plan to support Shibboleth Redis storage service and or Shibboleth Hazelcast storage service for Shibboleth IDP v4. I guess I can go ahead and jump in and hey, thanks for the question there. Yes, we do still plan on supporting both of those. They do actually both work in v4. We just have not upgraded the documentation yet for v4. 
And we are currently working on turning those into plugins for 4.1. So be on the lookout for those. Yeah, uh, one thing I'll highlight about the distinction of modules versus plugins. So the, the concept of modules in 4.1 is you've already got the software on your system, but if you, if you explicitly enable that module, if it isn't already, all that does is it exposes the config files for that feature, for that module, uh, which are actually packaged in the jar that's on, it's in your distribution. So a module is something you already have the software for, enabling it makes the config files visible to you to configure it. Um, and there actually is no master record of what that, something is determined to be enabled or not enabled basically by the, whether the config files for it are there or not. Um, plugins are different. You don't have the software yet. Plugins, you actually have to go out to a URL and get the software and add it into your IDP. And after you do that, then it actually is a module, which you then enable. So you get the software as a plugin, and then you enable it as a module to expose its config files. So plugins, by definition, you always have to go out somewhere to get the software. And, and they do have a security scheme around that, signing and that. So the first time you get one, it sets up a key structure on your disk so that you can verify that the software you're downloading is the software that they intended for you to get. Um, and plugins can then be on a separate maintenance schedule and have releases independent of new releases of the IDP because they are going to maintain as separate software packages. Thanks, Mike. All right, we've got one minute. Any final questions before we wrap up today? I'm watching the Q&A. Let me jump in as well uh, for something Mike mentioned earlier. I didn't have to do anything special to get the option to use the Duo Universal prompt when I went into my administrative panel. So you might need, you might just go out there and check if you're looking for it to see if it is an option for you. Thanks, JJ. All right, well, we really appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us for the open source support identity briefing. And um, as you have needs, go ahead and fill out those tickets and we'll be happy to assist. Our second briefing of the year will be at the end of Q3 starting into Q4. So watch for that notification to come your way later in the year. Everybody stay healthy, stay safe and have a great week. Thank you.